Welcome, welcome, welcome. Do you realize today that you are blessed and highly favored? You're tuning in right now because God wants to spur you along because your best and blessed days are still out in front of you. I'm J. Anthony Gilbert here with the incomparable <laughs> Pastor Amy Schaefer. So good to be with you again. Great to be with you, JJ. We are too blessed to be stressed. Yeah, I believe that. And today we have got a lot to talk about. You know, if our movement, the church, is not moving, it is not a movement. If our movement is not moving, it could be a monument. That's what we're going to talk about today. If you are to finish the Great Commission, we cannot get the credit as long as God gets the glory. We must move from me to we if we want they to ever hear about him. It's time to synergize, mobilize, and finalize the Great Commission in our generation. So I'm excited to talk to Dr. James O. Davis about his book called The Synergistic Church. Come on now, Jay. Yeah. We've got to be in synergy. we got to mobilize. we got to be in unity. we got to be together in this thing. Because the end time harvest is now, ladies and gentlemen. Then following that, if you are experiencing anything where you're feeling alone, feeling isolated, and you're going through a time of tribulation and trial and you need encouragement, we have a phenomenal author. Amber L.B. Swenson is here with us to encourage you that when life hurts, God has a word for you. God has not left you. And you know what? I believe we're in a season, Pastor Amy, yes. that God is going to move people out of trouble mm -hmm. into triumph. People are coming out of the prison like Joseph. Mm -hmm. They feel like they've been isolated all alone, but God is getting ready to elevate them to a place of prominence. And I believe this is going to encourage them. I know. I'm looking forward to it. Our next guest is the founder of the Global Church Network, and his goal is to see the Great Commission come to fruition in the year 2030. Dr. James O. Davis is recognized as one of the leading networkers in the Christian world, and he joins us today to share about his vision and how we too can play a part in making an impact for the kingdom. Dr. James, welcome to Hope Today. It's really a joy and an honor to be with you today and to be a part of the greatest time in the history of the world. This is the church's greatest and grandest moment. Amen. It really is. And it really is a joy to be with you and all the, the viewing audience today. Before we get started about the Synergistic Church, let's talk about you know what you do. What is your passion? You have a significant role in the body of Christ. Can you let everybody know what that is? Well, you're very kind. And again, thank you for the opportunity. You know, as a young Christian, I adopted my goal, the same as the Lord's goal, and that is for everyone to have access to the gospel. And the only problem is that goal is too big for any of us to achieve by ourselves. And so if you're going to build a net that works, you have to learn to tie enough relational knots. No knot, no net, no network. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to bench press a thousand pounds, you're going to have to have some spotters. And, and so we're going to have to really find a way to synergize together in order to mobilize, to finalize, as you said earlier. And so I just, as a Christian, not as a minister of the gospel, but as a Christian, I see myself as a Great Commission Christ-centered Christian and whose goal is to help finish the Great Commission. And if, I, if that becomes my goal, then I'm going to have to find enough people to help me do that. Can you kind of unpack what, what is synergy and what are we missing in the body of Christ and how can we get mobilized and synergized? Thank you very much. You know, in Romans 8:28, uh, it says, God works together all things. The, the word there is synergeo. God synergizes all things. Now, his all things are a lot bigger than my all things. If I said to you, I'm going to synergize all my things with you to help you, that would be something. But when God says, I, he synergizes all things, why does he do that for me? Because I love him. I'm called according to his purpose. So he synergizes the entire universe to help me because he loves me. And so synergy is really in the heart of, of God himself. But even in the New Testament, uh, repeatedly, um, you would see working together, Paul and Timothy and others, building synergy. 
Now, because the church world didn't use it, the business world stole it. It's our word. It's a New Testament word. Stephen Covey made it very fashionable in his book on the seven habits of highly effective people. In fact, law number six in his book, or habit six, is synergy, synergize. So when we were launching the, the network in the early days, the Global Church Network, I said to Dr. Bill Bright back in those days, we must have a synergize conference. And so every other year we have a synergize conference. And synergy is simply this is that the, together the value is far greater than the value of all the individual parts. It's a proven fact. You can have one horse pulling a load, but when you have two horses pulling the same load, it's not doubled, it's more than triple. So if we can synergize, recognize the individual parts of the body of Christ and the various structures of the body of Christ, but yet keep the goal finishing the Great Commission, we actually can do it. But if we're going to continue to work in individual parts, we're never going to finish the Great Commission that way. What got us here will not get us there. And so we have to synergize. That's why I wrote the book on the Synergistic Church, because I really do believe it is the answer to finishing the Great Commission. I think so often we look through the eyes of the church through our Western culture, but you really open our eyes in this book to see that there is a big church out there, bigger than just the Western church, and we've got to get the gospel out. Can you share with us uh, what is one of the fastest growing Christian communities in the world? And can you kind of give us a big picture of what has happened in Africa and some of the other sure. places that you're aware Thank of? Thank you very much. And, you know, back in the 1990s, my amazing wife, uh, we've been married 38 years, and uh, we laid to rest two children, one in 91, one in 1998. Mm -hmm. And then we were privileged to adopt two amazing daughters from China. So I often say made in China means something different to us and other oh. people. And our daughters are 18 and 23. And I remember one specific day, I was holding up my oldest daughter. And at that time, she was maybe a year and a half to two years old. And I was looking into her Asian eyes, and we were laughing out of the park. And I felt like the Lord whispered to me and said, look at who I've lifted up all over the world. And I took that extremely seriously. And I began to make a trip here and make a trip there, spend time with this mountain peak, spend time with that mountain peak to see what God had lifted up. If we want to know what God is up to, just look at what he's lifted up and you'll know what he's up to. We in the Western world think that everything that's the best and brightest in Christendom is in our, in our sphere, but that's not necessarily true. The, the strongest churches in all of the world are not here in the United States of America. Now, we think they are, but they're not. They haven't been for a long time. And so 3% of Christianity is here in America. 97% isn't. Wow. Now, if I'm not a Great Commission Christian, that 97% may not matter much. But if I am a Great Commission Christian, which I know our audience is, then the 97% matters. So when you think of Iran, for example, one of the fastest growing churches in all the world is in Iran. Now notice what how I said it. One of the fastest growing churches in Iran. I didn't say a single church. The church as a whole is twice the size today as it was when the revolution began. But we're not going to hear that. We're not going to hear that articulated but it is a factual truth. When we think of Indonesia, one of the largest Muslim population nations of the world, is now 28% Christian. We, we don't hear that, but, but it's a true and it is a factual reality. The churches that God has raised up all over the world are quite fascinating. By 2035, Africa will become the very first Christian continent. When we look at China, 45,000 plus a day coming to Christ. Wow. When we look at India, more than 20,000 a day are coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. When we now look in Eastern Europe and what the hunger that is there is going to bleed over into Western Europe. The Lord is at work 
everywhere. And what I would say to our audience, it's not as bad as you think it is. Christianity is not about to go out of business. Amen. The devil is not winning the war. The Lord is building his church. This is the greatest day in the history of the church. And we're, we're alive during this time frame on the earth to be a part of it. You are passionate about saying that we're going to believe God for a million ministers and for yeah. a billion souls. How can yeah. we be a part of that mission? Well, thank you. You know, um, the Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. What I would say to everyone, trust the story. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. The enemy says the ground is hard. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. And he also says, but the laborers are few. When you see Christianity slowing in the West, it's not because the ground is hard. It's not because people are not interested. Is that the laborers are few. We don't have as many laborers as we once did. Now, as a result of it, the harvest slows down. So therefore, the only way to accelerate the harvest is to equip more laborers and send them in the harvest field. I've looked at this all around the world, whether the church is going fast and we need more laborers, or the church is slowing down and we need more laborers. We need at least, when I use the word we, I don't mean the global church network, I mean the body of Christ. We need at least a million more uh, full, fully trained men and women of God in full-time ministry. And that number is low. In addition to that, the harvest will take care of itself if you have enough laborers in the harvest field. And so when we were launching the network, uh, we had made a commitment as a network, Dr. Brian and I, we wanted to help equip uh, 5 million church plants and see a billion come to Christ. We accomplished that goal in November of 2019 and synergistically across the body. And now we're focused on the finish line because we believe collectively we can finish it. It's a matter of want to, it's not a matter of how to. That is incredible. And we are part of that mission and vision with you to reach the lost, to reach people with the message of the gospel. Thank you, Dr. James, for your book, The Synergistic Church and Creating and Building a Church with No Limits, No Roofs and No Walls. Well, it's a joy to, to put the book out there for people to consume and to read. I think it will open people's eyes to, to truly the harvest field that's taking place around the world. And I would encourage our, our viewers, you know, check out the Global Church Divinity School where all the training is and, and check out Global Church Network to see what is happening in real time as we get in closer and closer. We're about to celebrate the 2000 year birthday of the church. It's just right around the corner. June 9, 10, and 11, 2030 in Jerusalem. And then when you're celebrating the two, you're commencing the three. We will be the church of the third millennium. And we need to start preparing how we're going to step in to the third millennium. And what does it look like as we strive to get closer and closer to the finish line? It's coming. Amen. We're ready to mobilize, yeah. strategize, and to be the synergistic church. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. It's my joy. Thank you very much. Stay with us. When we return in 60 seconds, we'll be joined by Amber Albi Swenson. And she's going to be talking about the difficult topic of what do you do when life hurts? We'll be right back. The barriers that stand between you and a blessed life may feel insurmountable, but Dr. Robert Jeffers assures you they can be overcome. This month, when you give your most generous gift to Cornerstone Television, we'll send you Dr. Jeffers' new book, Invincible, Conquering the Mountains that Separate You from the Blessed Life. Offering biblical insight and practical tools, he explains how you can conquer the hindrances of doubt, guilt, anxiety, discouragement, fear, and bitterness through prayer and faith in a God whose strength can move mountains. Request your copy when you support the gospel ministry of Cornerstone Television. Your generosity will evangelize the lost, encourage believers, provide excellent Bible teaching, and so much more. Call us today and become invincible, conquering the mountains that separate you from the blessed life. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. 
Thank you for giving. Well, you know, there's no denying that life isn't perfect. We've all experienced hurts or disappointments at one point or another in all of our lives. And when we face these challenges, there's one major key to help us get through them. Amber L.B. Swenson is a speaker, author, and podcaster. She joins us now to shed light on what we should be doing when life is currently hurting. Amber, so great to have you with us on Hope Today. Thanks for having me. I'm, great. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Yes, yes, yes. Well, listen, let's jump right in because, listen, there's no way you can write a book like this if you have not had some experiences in and through your world. What happened in your life that propelled this book? Yeah, I wish that suffering wasn't a part of life, and I wish that Jesus hadn't said that in this world there will be trouble. So for me, it was church hurt, which is, I know, something a lot of people can relate to. I um, took a stand about something that I saw going on that I didn't feel was right, that I knew wasn't right, and in the, I got ousted. And there was a lot of persecution and hurt that went along with that. And so through that whole time, I kind of learned who my friends were. I learned who the Lord was. And we're about five years post that time. And what I've learned is that I couldn't have written this book a whole lot earlier than I did because there was a whole lot of healing that had to take place between then and now. So... Can you go a little deeper into what happened uh, in the church hurt piece? I mean, you say you took a stance, but give us some more detail of what transpired and what went on. What was the stance that you took? Well, I saw somebody doing something that wasn't um, biblical, and I, I pointed it out. It was a, a, someone who was working in the church, and I pointed it out. And I thought, it, just between the two of us, that it would be, you know, thank you for pointing that out. It's not a, you know, I'll correct it, whatever. What ended up happening is that, you know, sides were formed and people rallied around one person and others around the other. And it didn't go as I thought it would. And, um, and so in the meantime, my family was involved. Of course, we got hurt. Uh, we ended up having to leave, like I said, because it was just too much. It was too much pain. Well, let me ask you this question. Uh, would you do it again? Looking back at that, because, you know, sometimes taking a stance uh, for those things, you do, you develop enemies because, you know, sometimes you can have a heart for God and you're running after God and you're doing everything he wants you to do and everybody doesn't want to do that stuff. So yeah. would you go back and do it over again the same way, even though it caused you the pain it did? Yes, I would. And Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble. What I would do differently is that it wouldn't hurt as much this time because I've learned enough that I would have walked away a lot sooner when there's wow. a lot of churches out there. So if it doesn't work in this church and if, if what you're seeing is not aligning with the word of God and you confront somebody biblical, biblically like, hey guys, we should probably not be doing this. If they don't turn, that's their decision. That's between them and God. And it's not my job, that's the Holy Spirit's job. So I would have walked away a lot sooner and just taking my family somewhere else where we could thrive in the word. Wow. So how did you work through all of that then? Obviously, the, you said you do it differently now. What are the lessons that you kind of gathered from that uh, to be able to get out sooner? Yeah, well, I'm a lot stronger than I was then. I still thought that I was, I was probably more of a people pleaser back then. And so I didn't want to take my stand and then and walk away because I just thought I should try to stay in and, and help things out. But one of the things I've learned is to gather really godly Christian people around you who can help you, who can help you forgive. I think forgiveness is a huge part of actually healing and learning to forgive people. It's a process. It's not an on off switch. It's a daily forgiveness. I'd also have people around me to hold me accountable, to tell me to walk away, not to engage anymore. You know, there's, there's no good work that's getting done if you're just embroiled in quarrels that nobody is moving. You hope in the church that you can, you know, confront each other biblically and you can apologize and move on. That's not always the case. So the work of God has to be done. If it's not working, like I said, move on. God will open plenty of doors for ministry elsewhere if this one isn't working for you. 
You know, Amber, there's a lot of uh, people that are battling in this season with church hurt. We take a look at what's going on down in Texas and the multiple churches that are going through those types of things right now. I mean, it, a church church can come in so many different forms and fashions. What is the biggest advice that you would give somebody on how to navigate out of church hurt? Because one of the things that I heard you mention that I think is so profound is that that purpose, uh, the purpose, God had purpose in your process. So there was a lot of pain in that, but it sounds like he was with you in that and he grew you in that. How could you encourage somebody to move beyond it and to be able to use it for purpose? Jesus didn't hurt you, someone in the church did. That is a, a something that I needed to learn and be reminded of that these people are, are sinful just like I am. We're all flawed. And so we all make mistakes and hopefully we can fess up to them, move on. But if not, um, we have to remember that Jesus didn't hurt you. His, his people did. And so don't give up on the church because a lot of people, as you've said, there's so much church hurt. I have found everywhere I go, people are saying, me too. I get it. I walked away. Some people have never returned to a church. And that's, that's when things... Um, you're not built up by the fellowship of believers and you're not getting fed. So to that, I would say, don't walk away from the church altogether just because of what some people in one church did. Find a different church, re-engage, remember who Jesus is and that he loves you and that his church will stand. You know, he wrote the, the um, he gave the letters in the book of Revelation to the churches and he was saying to them, look, guys, you're not getting it right. You got some changes to make. What he didn't say is we gave this church thing a shot and it didn't work out. So let's just quit doing it. So don't give up on the church. Go back, find some another place, find somewhere where you can worship and grow in your faith. Let me ask this question, kind of a little bit of a curveball question here, but I would love to hear your take on this. Why do you think all of this is happening now? There's so much church hurt happening. From your standpoint, you've come through it, not smelling like smoke, you're writing a book on how to navigate the hurts in life. Why do you feel God is allowing all this to happen in this season? I think it's always happened. You know, when you look at the, the where Jesus came into, I think the Pharisees were doing a good job of hurting people telling them they weren't good enough. That's why people clamored around Jesus is because Jesus was saying, it's not about keeping all these rules. It's about a relationship with me. It's about a relationship with my father. And I think as you see people clinging to Jesus and following him, it was because there was so much church hurt then. I think this has always existed. I think maybe for a time, we weren't publicizing it as much or people didn't know because we didn't have social media. We didn't have, you know, a camera in our face all the time where we do now. And so maybe people weren't talking about it as much, but I think it's always been around. And I think it's just a tool of the devil. The devil wants to destroy God's work. He wants to destroy God's church. How can he do that? Well, he can attack individual believers and get us hurt so that we don't want to persist in our faith and in, and in our church life. Well, thank you so much. We so appreciate you, Amber. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you need to get this book. You can trust God when life hurts. I've been in ministry for almost 30 years now, and it is outstanding to hear people come through the process and have a true testimony of how you too can overcome. Don't allow your church hurt and what you've gone through to stop you. God has a great plan for you. Thank you so much for joining with us today, Amber. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. You know, Pastor Amy, you know, there's a lot of church hurt going on in the world mm -hmm. today. Yeah. You know, people are really struggling. I mean, I've gotten phone calls from mm -hmm. people all over and you just see so many things happening, things popping up in the media. What's the Lord speaking to you about just all this that's been going on? Well, I mean, I think what we feed on is what will grow. And so, you know, in, in the first book, we're just talking about the magnificent church of the Lord Jesus Christ that he rescues and delivers and saves. And in that we're dealing with humans, humans that fall, humans that fail. You know, my husband and I were talking the other day, like, what if we fell? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, it's just like one bad decision, one dumb move. 
and it's like you fall and just everything collapses. Here's the thing. That's why we have to keep our eyes fixed on. on Jesus. On. He on. is the head That's of the right. church and pastors are human. Leaders in the church are human. We will miss it. We will fall short, but the church is strong. It is vibrant. It is alive. The church is helping people. The church is rescuing people. The church is here to mobilize on the earth. It is really Jay, his kingdom come Amen. on earth. Amen. as it is in heaven. Amen. And so, you know, with all of the messes that go on with people, there is still a God that is good, that is Come faithful, on. that is anointing his church, that is filling his church with his presence and his power and his peace. And we need that like never before. Amen. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, if we didn't put people so high, they wouldn't fall so far. Mm. They're just men and women. We're pastors. We're yes. just men and women. Oh. I had somebody not too long ago that came to me and they were upset because mm -hmm. of something that I didn't know, but right. they were so hurt by it. And they said, well, right. I put you on this pedestal. Yes. And I said, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I am a human being. If I don't brush my teeth, if I don't put on deodorant, I'll stink just like anybody else. <laughs> so the reality is, is that we are just men and women of God. Yes. And I think that that whole thing that she mentioned, many people look at it like, well, they're Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're Jesus, you know? And so when they fall, it's like my savior has fallen. Ladies and gentlemen, the day of the superstar ministry mm -hmm. is over. God is mobilizing all of his people to be the synergistic church. Yes. And I believe a lot of these hurts and stuff is because God wants to motivate you. He wants to mobilize you. He wants to grow you and develop you because you have a call. You have a destiny, you have a purpose. The harvest that is getting ready to come in, it's not one church, it's not one pastor, it's not one minister, it is the body of Christ. And if we allow God to grow us, develop us, heal us, and become all that we need to become, I believe we can see those billions of soul yes. harvests come in in Jesus' name. I mean, isn't that what we want? Don't we want what God wants? And what He wants are people to know Him. That's why we have to mobilize, Come we have on. to strategize, we have to get in unity, we have to be the synergistic church so we can reach people for Christ. That's what it's all about. Jesus bled, died, rose again. He's alive and well, and his church Hallelujah. is living and breathing and active on the earth, and you and I get to be a part of it. So let's be synergistic today, and that will bring you so much hope today.